Thank you for your practice and maybe moving the body in whatever way it would like right now and taking care of the body that takes care of us. So a few years ago, um, I teach a retreat at Dhammadena, which is how I met Coral, um, that's for queer folk, and it's in the high desert of California, Joshua Tree, and it's at a retreat center called Dhammadena, and, um, and for a number of years I taught that retreat with Irina Weissman and Leslie Booker, and Irina has since retired, but Booker and I are continuing to teach that retreat, and it's going to be the last half of this October, if you're interested. <laughs> but the reason I'm talking about it is because um, two years ago, when we were planning the retreat and figuring out, you know, what we were going to write um, as an invitation, this phrase, how can we hold our grief, our shame, and our joys in these challenging times came up as one of the phrases we might want to use. And I just noticed the immediate aversion I had to the word shame. I was like, who wants to talk about that? And it was really interesting to see that reaction. And I kind of came to realize through that, that avoiding it is a guiding principle of my life. It's really one of the ways that I organize what I do and what I don't do. Um, and so I want to talk about shame tonight, and there's a, uh, there's a nice show about this Argentinian fashion designer named Santiago Artemis. I don't remember what network it's on, but it's called No Time for Shame. <laughs> and so tonight I want to create some space for shame and to bring it out of the shadows a bit. Um, because it's even just as a word, it's a really powerful word. You know, what comes up for you just hearing shame or knowing that the talk today is going to be about it? And is there a physical reaction at all? Is there a version coming up maybe? Red with shame, hot with shame, dying of shame, flooded with shame. It's a pretty powerful word. And for me, it's one of the most intense and difficult emotions. Um, and I probably deal with it more than I deal with a lot of the other intense emotions. It seems to be a really sticky one for me. And this is a big part of the Dharma. How do we hold these really powerful feelings that are a natural part of the human experience? How do we make room for what's difficult? How does our practice and how do the Buddha's teachings give us tools or resource us though, that we can be more at peace with the places that hurt. The Buddha said a lot of times I teach suffering and the end of suffering. And these difficult emotions, shame, regret, hatred, grief, loss, you know, these are places where so much human suffering is located. And these are the places that it can be really difficult to inhabit, to relate to, sometimes even just to acknowledge or hear, because usually I want to be anywhere else than with them, with these difficult mind states. And at the same time, it's not possible because these emotions are a natural part of being human, of being embodied. So while we're going to probably experience these emotions all throughout our life, it's possible that we might learn how to be less afraid of them. We may suffer less in their presence as we begin to really know them as they are. And as we begin to hold our experience with more and more kindness, more patience and more compassion. So it's kind of like living in the desert where I live in Southern California and there are diamondback rattlers and there are scorpions tarantulas and crazy scary things called desert centipedes. And as long as I live here, I know that when I venture out onto the land, I'm going to see these beings from time to time as they go with the land. It's their land. 
and I could shut down in fear of them, or I could go back to Washington State where I lived most of my life where there are no poisonous snakes west of the Cascades. I could stay at home, I never go outside and deny or avoid their natural presence, or I could choose to understand them better and to know their habits and their locations and increase my understanding and respect for them. So that when I do eventually encounter one, I can behave in a way that's appropriate and is less likely to lead to harm for them or for myself. And that's much more skillful than if I just rely on that autonomic response when I see a snake or a scorpion or whatever it is. And there's, it feels similar to me, you know, seeing a snake and ha or having that experience of shame, because there's like a pre-verbal component for me, for sure. There's that rush of shame of being flooded or just wanting to fall through the floor. And it's kind of like, you know, when I see that snake along the trail, physical, visceral, and it takes some time for me to even know, oh, this is shame that I'm feeling because my response is usually to run from the discomfort and the situation that's triggered it as quickly as I possibly can. It's a raw kind of emotion and Research shows what we know, that in a moment of shame, logical thinking goes offline, what we know from experience. And there's a physiological urge or need for self-protection. So a researcher on shame, Gerald Fishkin, wrote this, shame isn't associated with cognition at all. At the precise moment shame is triggered, we are emotionally hijacked and there is no prefrontal activity. We automatically want to be anonymous and invisible. Emotionally hijacked. That rings true for me when I think of my experience of shame, the dukkha of shame. So it's interesting to look a little at the physical experience and then um, we need to look at the cause. And shame is tricky because the wish to get away, to become anonymous, invisible that accompanies shame doesn't invite us to look very deeply, to examine it, because I want to put as much distance between me and that moment of shame as I can. I don't want to look at it, I want to run away. And as soon as there is some distance, I want to pretend that I never felt it. So it comes in a lot of flavors, as we <laughs> probably all know, and I'll name some a little later. But at the core, you know, in the Buddha's way of identifying the three root poisons of greed or aversion and delusion, it's very much aversion, self-aversion, a sense of being wrong or unworthy in some way, of being found deficient or not worthwhile, unlovable, of not belonging, particularly not belonging. And most of us don't really need that disapproval to come from outside, from others. We judge ourselves and then we imagine what others must be thinking or seeing. Especially as queer folk or marginalized folk in this homophobic, transphobic, binary, racist culture, you know, we experience, and unless we're always alert and ready for it, we experience dominant culture's judgment or the ghosts of that judgment of parents, of teachers, of bullies even our peers. And underneath that sense of unworthiness is the sense that we're broken somehow, that we're not deserving of love and connection. It's a really, really painful emotion. And it's a hindrance not only to happiness, but it, it also can be a hindrance to our practice. When I started meditating on a regular basis at home, I noticed again and again waves of shame and regret like coming into my experience and the discomfort was enough to literally propel me off the cushion. I'd remember something I did do or that I didn't do or something that I said the wrong way or something that I did that was harmful and boom, you know, I'd be off the cushion. No time for shame at all. No way. I don't want to be with this at all. And I think, you know, might have been a good clue. This is something I need to bring some kind of attention to. And this is actually one of the ways that the hindrance of shame or hindrance of aversion shows up in our practice. 
through that hijacking sense of shame, that I'm not okay, that I'm not capable, that I'm intrinsically flawed, that I can't do this, or that I'm an imposter, that I'm gonna be found out. And you can't imagine how common that is for people who offer Dharma talks. You know, that lurking fear that all my negative self-assessments are actually true and that you see it so clearly. And so even sitting here 3,000 miles away from some of the folks here tonight, but pretty far <laughs> from almost everyone here, it's still an incredibly vulnerable place to be. You know, it's an edge for sure. And that fear of shame or humiliation is like an incredible motivator. It works. It works. I'll go to incredible lengths to avoid feeling shame. It works, but you know, at what cost? And I ask myself, is this how I want to live? Is this how any of us want to live? Making choices and acting motivated by the fear of judgment, motivated by the fear of feeling that pain of shame. It feels to me like the exact opposite of where our creativity lives. So what is this energy? It's both powerful and a little slippery because shame likes to hide. And it's so unpleasant that when, you know, the activation of shame has passed, we really don't want to go back. I know I'd rather do anything than recall moments when I felt exposed or humiliated or laughed at. And yet the conditioning is still there, activated or not, examined or not. It's there ready to pop up. So the scientific research on shame says that it's a relatively late and uniquely human phenomenon or emotion. And when I read that, I was like, no, no, no. I know dogs feel shame. I'm sure of that. And then I looked into that and apparently animal behaviorists don't believe that dogs really feel shame the way that humans do. They believe that dogs have learned how to adopt a posture and, uh, and a face and act in ways that make us feel sorry for them because we think they're experiencing shame. They're mirroring back this crazy thing that we've evolved to do to ourselves. And it's mostly about the fear of being disconnected from others because of behaviors that fall outside of group norms. So we know as social animals that being cast out or rejected from the group is an incredibly vulnerable and dangerous place to be. So it's a kind of self-awareness of how we are fitting in, how we are seen. And so the pain of shame is a negative motivator to keep us from doing something that might cause us to be cast out or targeted. And the really interesting thing about this to me is that research shows that it isn't related to our own personal sense of right and wrong, to our own conscience, to our own ethics, to what we actually really believe, but that we feel shame about transgressing group norms, whether we share the norms or not, whether we really believe in them or not. So this makes so much sense as a queer person or marginalized people, the internalized shame that we carry, that we have because we've absorbed these norms. And yet at the same time in our hearts, we know there's nothing wrong with how we are or who we are or what we are or how we identify. So much of this is what's been received. We're conditioned to feel shame depending on our culture and our caregivers, and then we internalize that voice so that we're inflicting pain on ourselves even when there's no one watching because of that drive to keep safe. And we all know those voices. And there is a big difference between shame and guilt. Guilt is more, oh, I'm sorry I did that. I can see that that caused harm. I would really like to avoid doing that in the future, and I'm hoping there's a way to repair this. And shame is much more, I'm a bad person, I'm defective or deficient, and I'm never not gonna be this way. And there's a big difference there, because shame isolates and separates us from others. We wanna hide, disappear, but guilt often leads us to make amends, to connect with people, 
to heal and to repair. And I want to talk a bit about how we practice with shame or really any difficult emotion. And at the same time, I also want to name shame because for something that's common to the human experience, we don't talk about it all that much. So maybe we know how it feels, hot, bitter, red, paralyzing, and it comes in so many flavors. And there are so many ways that we're shamed by others or receive and internalize messages of shame in this world. One of the first ones I remember experiencing consciously was being shamed for my sensitivity. You're too sensitive. Or maybe you're too sensitive for a boy or whatever it was. And you, really what they were saying is your heart's too open. <laughs> Which is a crazy thing to say to a kid. And then there are all these varieties of shame that we live with and experience. Body shame, gender shame, sexuality shame, kink shame, race shame, financial shame, achievement shame, ability shame, shame around chronic illness, shame around neurodivergence, shame around aging, shame about what we feel, shame about how we express ourselves, shame about what we're interested in. And then there's that diffuse sort of, you're, you're just not right shame, all these subtle forms of shame. Even shame about how we communicate, shame that we talk too much or people think we talk too much or that we don't talk enough. And our very most basic human needs and expressions can be shamed. And I'm sure that you can add to this list. Because when you get down to it, it's that shame of being human, which is the craziest, most preposterous thing that we somehow buy into the shame of being human. I'll speak for myself, but yeah, it's true. It's like just basic human functions, basically the way I am, I can feel shame about just my natural self. All the ways that we're othered and diminished and dismissed and literally colonized by the energies that seek to control us. And shame is a tremendously effective means of doing this. We're colonized because we internalize the voices of shame and effectively continue their work of isolating and dividing and undermining our confidence. It's really like a virus, you know, we get infected with this. And then like an antidote, you know, I hear my mentor, Rena Weissman's words, if it's not kind, it's not true. If it's not kind, it's not true. If there's not kindness in the field, we are not really seeing clearly. There's nothing true in this kind of shaming, nothing that benefits. Nothing that comes from this intuitive and aware mind that we are strengthening in our practice. So rather than encourage our highest intentions of connection, of care, of growth, shame actually isolates and paralyzes and says no to the beauty in us. So when we get into a situation with someone that's difficult, you know, we often, if shame is triggered, we often just go to self-focus, you know, what is that person thinking of me? And what are my patterns of shame believing in that moment? So that rather than being able to connect and focus on both of our needs and experience in that moment, all I can see is my own because I'm in pain. And I'm really unlikely to work skillfully with a situation when I'm gripped by shame and I don't even see it. You know, that's the suffering that arises from aversion, the pain of feeling that internal disapproval, that internal abandonment. You know, this is a complete opposite of unconditional love. And I don't have too much time tonight, but I know some of us who like go to Dharma talks and classes and stuff have heard of Hiri and Otapa um, which are always translated in my experience as shame and moral dread, and they're considered the guardians of the world. And um, I just want to just put a plug in there. Like if you've heard that teaching before, 
the Buddha did not mean this kind of shame when he said that. He meant the shame, shame in the sense of conscience, ethics, our, our integrity. Um, and, and that's a sense of the word that's really been lost. But we're not talking about this um, sort of self-inflicted violence of shame. Um, anyway, I could do it. There's a whole talk on that. <laughs> but, um, but I just want to underscore that even though that word is sometimes used, that the way we use the word today, shame has no place in the Buddha's teaching because it is self-aversion and it's delusion. And there's two of the three poisons right there. So what we're really talking about is that sense of caring and connectivity and justice that moves us toward the greater good, not self-interest, small self-interest, but what's truly in our self-interest, the inner voice of our Buddha nature, what connects us to each other. And that couldn't be further from that painful, hot sense of shame. Let's see, as in the Buddhist teaching, none of us are intrinsically wrong. None of us deserve to feel this difficult emotion of what we call shame. It's just part of inhabiting this human body and having this human mind and brain. And usually in talks on shame, um, teachers will bring up Angulimala who murdered 999 people, it says in the ancient Buddhist teaching stories, the suttas. And he was about to murder the Buddha, but he didn't because the Buddha talked him out of it and got him interested in something other than killing. And of course, you know, as the story goes on, he became completely enlightened. So, you know, even somebody who had killed 999 people and was about to kill the Buddha was not outside of the Buddha's teaching and the Buddha's care and the possibility of healing and wholeness. So Ayakema says the formula is this, recognize no blame change. Recognize no blame change. There's, so there's no time for shame in that equation. In other words, see what's happening, let go of shaming and blaming, and focus on the appropriate response in this moment from this place of connection. And of course, make the amends necessary when we've harmed another being or attempt to. So how do we hold shame in the context of Dharma? How do we do that? Well, you know, of course you can work with a therapist or talk to friends and that is incredibly healing to have someone witness your feelings of shame. And then how do I work with shame as an expression of my practice? So first step, don't shame the shame. Don't shame yourself for feeling shame. It's okay that it's happening. So remembering that this sense of shame that we have is hardwired, that we've evolved to feel it, it's normal. It's in place as a defense against acting in ways that might result in disconnection from the group. It's a bit of pain, sometimes a lot of pain, to remind us of the life-threatening pain of being potentially exiled from the group. So that first mindful step, you know, can I be aware of the shame when I feel it and not run from it like I did? you know, just jumping up and running off the cushion. That's a huge step, simply naming it. This is the third foundation of mindfulness, knowing our mental states, aware of body, aware of sensation, aware of mental states. And shame is such an uncomfortable one, so paying attention to it feels sometimes like the last thing we wanna do. And yet it's absolutely key to working with shame or any of the difficult mind states. And I, I really want to stay here for a moment because the ability to be with what's uncomfortable is key to our practice. You know, it's lovely to experience joy and stillness and peace. And I hope all of us experience those mind states a lot. But 
being human, we're going to experience these difficult ones too because of the way life unfolds and how it is to have a human mind and body and heart. So, I have an anecdote there, but I think I'll move on. But the point of it was just to also say that sometimes just any attention on ourselves can feel, can trigger shame. And that's something to really pay attention to and, and hold very carefully and tenderly. It's something I've noticed in myself a lot. We may notice it in our unwillingness to accept a compliment or, or accept a friendly offering. And so noticing if there's shame present, um, in those cases is it's only through recognizing the presence of the shame that I can begin the healing process, that I can even take a step in that direction. Otherwise, it's just something that's happening and fear of it runs my life. So that there's that question. Can I not shame the shame or myself for having it? Can I recognize that this is part of being human? And having made some room simply by naming it and not running away, can I hold it and the experience of it in a new way? Because this is what the Dharma is about. Recognizing, seeing clearly as we possibly can, and then changing our relationship to what is based on that seeing. Listening to ourselves as we would listen to a dear friend going through the same appreciating their courage, not rushing past what was uncomfortable, listening fully to ourselves without judgment, without adding any further shame by dismissing the feeling or minimizing the experience, bringing that light of awareness to whatever it is with as little judgment as we possibly can, without rushing, with mindfulness, with bearing witness with standing near. So a question that I came across and I don't know who said it, but do we believe that not paying attention to suffering will diminish pain? Do we believe that not paying attention to suffering will diminish pain? It's interesting to reflect on that because I think a lot of times I have acted as though I believed that. And appreciating the strength of vulnerability to show another our places of shame is incredibly brave and incredibly vulnerable. And to show those places to ourselves may be even braver. So working dharmically with shame, recognizing the shame or whatever the difficult emotion is, not chasing it away, keeping space around it, allowing it to open, noticing how it really, really feels. What's not just how we think it feels, but what's the body's response to it? And then what's the mental response to it? What's the heart response to it? And then that question, is it true? The feeling is true, but is the story true? And if it's not true, then how does my relationship to that story change? Or how might it change? And then as part of our right effort, we cultivate wholesome mind states, compassion, caring, faith, wisdom. So we can reclaim our innocence, that state before shame. We can reteach ourselves our loveliness like the poet Galway Kinnell says. May I accept myself as I am in this moment. May I accompany this experience with kindness. May I feel my own care. May I be able to receive it. So Bell Hooks wrote in her beautiful book, All About Love, Love knows no shame. 
Love knows no shame. So thank you for your attention and I might at at four fifty nine, um, but I know Carl said we could take a few minutes, <laughs> go over a few minutes. So I, I do want to create space for anybody who'd like to share. Um, yeah, thanks, Carl. For yeah, if it's not kind, it's not true. I puzzled over that for a while. So, anyone have anything you'd like to to share or ask? You can also write in the chat if you're shy. Oh, I'll I'll stop recording. That might get people to 